Uh, let's start very slowly. So today we'll talk about physics uh, and measurements, and it will tie together with what we've been talking about so far. So let's just recap what we've been talking about. We talked about this kind of puzzles and paradoxes that we call this logical reinforced selection paradoxes. And then, you know, originally when we introduced the first examples like this Lucin, uh, sorry, the Hardy paradox or, or the pigeons, we said that they are about counterfactual measurements. So we do something and, uh, and then at the end we think about something that didn't happen but could have happened, right? So they were about this. And then we saw that the, this actually corresponds to if we have a setting that gives us a, a, a logical paradox of this form, this is a proof of contextuality. It, which, is, which means it rules out a class of hidden variable theories that seem to be very natural. Okay. But now, uh, what we'll do today is try to get rid of this thing of like the fact that it's, you know, we can never observe it in practice. We can only think about what could have happened. It's a counterfactual. So it's not something that happened, right? Um, you know, in, in real life, we think of, we use counterfactuals in, in practice, but there are some subtleties. So for example, you know, the penalties for driving drunk are very high, not because what happened, but because of what could have happened, right? But you could say, well, you know, but this is something we can actually observe in practice. If we let, you know, a million people uh, drive drunk, we'll see some accidents and we'll see some, some deaths, right? So we can actually observe these statistics. Whereas here, you know, in every round of the experiment, we only observe one of these measurements. We can never, um, we can never uh, observe it too. So let's try to observe it too. That, that's what we, we're gonna do. But of course, like, you remember this version of, of, of of Hardy's experiment where we just say, well, we prepare this state. And then we just say, well, you know, here they hypothetically do a Z measurement. This is the one that doesn't really happen. And at the end they do an X measurement, right? And now we want to do both of them to observe them. And of course we know this is not possible to do two performing, to, to do two projective measurements that don't commute because there's a, state disturbance, right? But what we'll do is to replace this with a sort of measurement that just disturbs the state a little bit and that we can still observe some trace of this, um, of the statistics. Okay, so for this, sadly, we need to leave the world of quantum information, which is very beautiful and abstract and go back to physics and think about what is a measurement. Okay, so how do you measure the spin of a, of a part of the lab? You turn on a magnetic field, right? Like in the stern galach experiment, which means that the spin gets entangled with the position degree of freedom. And at the end, you measure whether, you know, like, like this kind of thing. There goes your spin, it goes through the magnetic field, and then it goes up or down, depending on the, on the spin direction. And then what you measure at the end is the position, right? How do you measure, um, I don't know, in a trapped ion? and you have some qubit and how do you measure whether it's on the zero state or in the one state, you don't go there. You, you never observe this directly. You excite the state, you let it relax, whatever. It emits some photon at the end, the photon hits the screen and you measure this frequency of the photon, right? You measure this thing, not the system itself, okay? So in general, all measurements are interactions of some form, okay? That's, that's the idea from here. Uh, so I'll just do a, draw a scheme in general. When we say, oh, we have some system S that we want to measure, what we're actually doing is we kind of couple it to something else. 
So for example, here we couple the, the spin to the momentum. And then what we measure is other observable. So we start with something else, your measurement device or your photon. There's a unitary that couples the two. And then we don't actually go there and observe this directly, but we measure here our pointer. Okay. Of course, you know, if you take this later, then you can also think, oh, here we don't measure directly this photon, it just interacts with something else, and in the end, interacts with something in a device, and those device in this like reflects the light and the light hits our eyes, and these are all unitary interactions, and we're all entangled with everything, right? Uh, and if you if you don't like this, you're free to propose an alternative macroscopic theory that explains how we see measurements that doesn't doesn't cause problems, right? This is very hard. Okay, so the idea is that here, we're gonna tune this unitary here to make it such that when it does not disturb the state as, as much as when we do a projective measurement, here we don't get as much information about the initial state, but if you repeat this enough times, you can collect measurement statistics for, for the two measurements. Okay, so first, we're going to spend some time just looking at what a measurement is. And I might need to take some time of Ralph's lecture on Wednesday to continue. So simplest case of how something can be measured in this, sometimes it's called von Neumann procedure. So suppose that we have Some initial state for now, let's let's be simple at their pure states. This is the system we want to measure. We don't know what the state is. And this is our measurement device, our pointer. So we're free to prepare this however we want. Okay. And then suppose we want to measure some observable. Uh, and for now, let's make it very simple. Corresponding to a projective measurement. Okay, let's let's do it like this. So what this corresponds to is depending on how long ago you had quantum mechanics. These are the projectors, and this is the eigenvalue, right? It's just a different way to represent. Um, measurement. If this is what you read. We'll see, we'll read this at the end in, in our pointer. And this is the projectors. Okay. Good. And let's make it even easier. For now, uh, let's just make this like, like a basis measurement, okay? Take it very, very easy. We, in the end, it can be any Thing here, but let's say this equal from a basis. Okay. Uh, good. And in principle, both these things, these things can be continuous or discrete. Uh, and we're going to look at the example where this one is discrete, and this is continuous. And then in the exercise sheet next week, you'll get, you'll play with different types of. Uh, of dimensions here and there. But so just to say, like, we can expand, we can always expand the state. Let's say this is discrete. Well, we can always expand it in the basis of this observable. Okay. okay, and here is this. Okay. Let's give it a name, like, oh, okay. And for the pointer, well, let's go back to this stern garlock experiment. Let's say it's just, just like a position pointer, okay? So it's a continuous pointer, so say,
uh, we can expand it in the x basis. So this is again just and that's and that's what we call the wave function. We could also make it a discrete one. Doesn't matter. Good. So one very simple way to to implement this measurement is by taking this interaction Hamiltonian. This is the thing we want to measure. And this is some other operator on system M that we'll tweak later depending on how we want our pointer to behave. Uh, why is this interesting? So when you say now I let this state evolve for some time T according to this Hamiltonian, then U of T is just E to minus I T. Right, so we're going to look at this. So if you've done this calculation already before, then you can try to do it now for B equals the momentum. Operator, to keep yourself busy. So what's this thing? H is this thing. So we just do a Taylor expansion of this thing. Okay. So over n, one over n square, and now we have here gamma, and now we have here a to the n, b to the n. So what's a to the n? Because it's easier to write. Okay, with this, but this is these are part of a projective measurement, which means that you know they're all orthogonal and they're uh, the pi square equals pi. So then this whole thing is just sum over k. Okay, N. Which means that now, look, this thing is just a number, right? It's not an operator. The AKs are also just numbers. And the only operator that is left on the, on the S system does not depend on N. So we move everything that has N dependencies to the other side. Okay, so we do here, we keep here the PK. This is on system S. And on the other side, we have this whole thing. So we have, oh, sorry, I missed the sum, sum over K. And here we have the sum over N. Or 
n, a k to the n, but now this again this is just a Taylor the Taylor expansion of the exponential, right? So we just we're left with sum of a k, by k of s tensor, the exponent of y t gamma. AK. So what's the idea is because this A represents a projective measurement, right? We can write the time evolution as just a projector, the sum of the projectors on the first system and everything else, including the eigenvalues, get shifted to the second system. So now what does it happen on what happens when we apply? This to our initial state. Uh, okay, so over k. No, just reply the pi case. I replace the pi case directly by this. Answer. Answer. This thing, we don't know what it is, right? Okay. okay. Apply to eta. Okay. So, so uh, this alpha case, aka. And now we'll just call this whole thing state k. Right? So this is on S, this is on M. Okay. So, so far, this is very general, right? It's any two uh, operators there. Good. Uh, so now there's two limits for, for this. One is the limit of strong measurements, which corresponds to all of these elements here being orthogonal. And weak measurements is when they're, they're very much overlapping. So let me just write this. So, and then we'll look at it in the pictures. And we as much is when strictly it's much larger than zero. Uh, of course, it's still smaller than one, but kind of close to one. Uh, why? Well, let's look at the reduced states. Of the two, two of the two things. Okay. First, what's the reduced state of of the measurement device? Well, all these AKs are orthogonal by definition, so we have uh, row M. Some of the k of yeah. uh, okay. Now, if we look at the reduced state of S, 
So for strong measurements, that all the things on the second system are orthogonal, so you get essentially the same. Okay. Uh, okay. okay. And this, by the way, is the same as if it was, um, as if you had added with the tunnel that we saw before corresponding to this projective measurement, right? On the original, on, on sorry, on the original stage. So in the limit of the strong, of strong measurement, then what's happened to S is exactly the same as if we had measured uh, with an all projective measurement, right? But if it's weak, and we say that all this, this uh, eta k's are almost all the same, then uh, OS is gonna be approximately the initial stage, okay? Approximately, right? Because this thing on the left, so the thing on the left is the initial stage, the thing on the right tensors out because they're all the same, approximately, okay? Of course, this is not exactly, but close enough to this, right? That's why in the limit of weak measurement, uh, we say we don't disturb the state of rho s, which is what allows us to do many measurements. But the question is, can we still get information out of this? Okay. Okay, and the answer is uh, yes, you can. And to prove it, well, to prove it, I'll call to Rolf and see which one of us will prove it next week. But I want to give you an intuition of what happens already. So for this, we're going to look at the at a very common example. Well, what we want is that, you know, if the, this is X and this, suppose that it, it's a, a very nice Gaussian state for the initial state of the, of the pointer, corresponding to a particle that is more or less as classical as possible in this position, okay? And then what we want is that depending on the different outcomes, this thing, moves to the right or to the left. Okay, so they should, so this would be kind of, uh, the original wave function, and then we'd want that it moves, uh, and k of x, and here, and k prime, and this can be done by <laughs> so this is I mean most classical idea of a measurement right so that really physically moves your pointer so for this what we take is we take this operator b that we have not defined yet to be just a momentum operator yeah. now, if you thought you're of momentum and position basis. Here they are again. Okay. What was the definition of this? Of this P state is just the conjugated basis to the position basis. So but it's not perfect. Okay. So I will not I have the computation here and you can do it yourselves because it's it's good for the soul to revisit this QM1 things now and then. But what happens in this case uh, is that So 
look, what happens on this case is that on the right side, on the right hand side, what we have is this e to i g over h bar a k p, right? Uh, minus i g p a k. And when this acts on this um, position against states, what it does, it shifts it, shifts them by this amount. So what's happening here is that indeed it just shifts the wave function to the right or to the left. Right? So this would correspond, for example, to k equals one and this k equals minus one. How do you make this a weak or strong measurement? Well, you can either make the initial wave function very thin or very wide, right? Or you can make this g larger or smaller. And what's g is just the strength of the interaction times the time, right? So either you let it interact for a long or short time, a strong interaction or a weak interaction. That's why another reason why it's called weak measurement. You just make this. Is that clear so far? Yes. What did I write? Where? Uh, so this would be k equals minus one, k, a k, sorry, a k equals one, a k equals one. Yeah. Okay, so we might put this as an exercise to prove this. All right, so now, let's just draw it to give some intuition and then we're gonna add the post-selection. So okay, now what's a strong measurement in this case? You get all these peaks that don't overlap. Right? You get one here, one peak there. Uh, another one in a different color. Okay. And and what is I can even map this exactly to trace of well, M, which is the probability of finding uh, do, 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 do. Uh, X. Okay, that's just taken directly from the reduced state. This is just because the reduced state of M we saw squared. M. Right. So it's like this whole area here corresponds to like a squared. This corresponds to another and so on. And this correspond to the wave functions of the of the individual states there, which in the, they were shifted, and it's a strong measurement, so they don't overlap. Um, yeah, and they're rescaled by this factor up and down. Okay. So then, what happens now? So we measure the pointer, 
if we find if we find the position here or in any way in this yellow area this corresponds to measuring the observable uh, directly on the system and obtaining this outcome k if we find it here it corresponds to same thing but outcome outcome k prime right so we know directly you know like in the standard graph experiment for measuring the position we know if the spin was up or down good what happens in the case of a, of a weak measurement then it's much more uh, ambiguous so you know if, if you measure the position then here you don't know from which contribution this comes from right so you don't get that much information and we'll quantify this precisely next week okay but now we wanted to add uh, selection i'll just write one thing here all right so for example if we measure now the average position of m in both cases what you get at the end it's going to be you know this phrase of types m which is sum over k um like k squared yes. right. and for that particular case so suppose that the initial gaussian is centered around zero then every each of these individual gaussians is centered around g a k right so in that special case you get sum over k G A K, but this is just G times the average of my observable if I had measured it directly in the initial stage, right? Because again, if I had measured directly A. Okay. Right. Which is exactly this whole thing, but without it, okay. Square. So, what? So, missing a square always? Should be right to the square, right? Without the square? That's right. No, that's right. Without the square. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Without the square. Sorry. Because it's uh, because it's the observable, not the uh, okay. So this is true. So if I measure now, independently of what is weak or strong, I do this procedure many times. I measure the position of the of the pointer many times. If I average it out, the average is always going to be the same average as if I had measured the system directly with this observable. Right? Okay. Now we add the post selection. Meaning what? So we start with S, we start with my special stage ether here. We make them interact. And only a different system, so it doesn't really matter which one I measure first, but what I'll measure here is the thing that you're interested in, which is, oh, is my post selection phi? Or is it anything else? And here, I do this measurement, for example, of the position, but could be anything else, okay, of the pointer. And now, 
And now I pull select the statistics here. So on get it. Meaning. I repeat the whole thing many times, and then I'm going to look at uh, what position I got here. And we will um, only consider the rounds where here the outcome was um, fine. OK. Now, of course, this will change the distribution because we're post selecting on something that we don't know what, which could be, for example, uh, something over here, right? So it's gonna, in, and in the case, in the same cases where we have, actually where we have proofs of contextuality, then this will give us, and in particular in all these logical paradoxes, it will give us uh, what's called an anom anomalous value, which is something that is outside the range of the original eigenvalues of, um, of A. So, let's just look first at what is the final stage then. Uh, right here. So you're going to look at what is the final state at this point here. Okay, I'm going to call it. So we did an interaction, we did a measurement, and we post select. Okay, so it's a post measurement state, which is what uh, M. It's going to be one of our squares. P, P is the probability that this post selection works times well, this projection into the post selected state. And here, okay. 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 F is okay. okay. And now we have here. Okay. okay. So it's just a proposition of the of this of all of the states, right? With the coefficients given by this. And this thing, like if you remember what this alpha k was, this is do 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 do. Okay. So we can rewrite this in a way that's a bit more familiar to us, which is this. It's starting to look a bit familiar and a bit similar to what we've seen in the uh, with this ABL probabilities. It was a term that appears there. Okay. Good. And now, if I now want to measure some quantity here, I don't want to do this. Now, let's look at a special case first. OK, we'll look at the special case for today of the strong measurement, and then next week we'll look at the special case of the weak measurement. Okay, 
So we look at the strong measurement. In this case, the after u, this is the state of S. Uh, it's going to be a mess. No, there's no saving it. Too much. Okay, so in this case, so what is P? This is the probability that that post-selection works, right? We don't care about the global state for that, only about the reduced state of S. So that's trace of this of S. Rho S was this thing here. So that's just over K. It's alpha K prime. And now A K. Right. Which is, if I write this down again, Oh, uh, da, 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 da. Yeah. It's going to be exactly the same as in the in the cases we saw before with an actual measurement, with the protective measure without this physical view of the probability that the print post selection works, right? So now suppose that we want to measure the position of the final thing, which I erased, great. Okay, so now suppose we want to measure the position, the average position of this final state, right? So that's gonna be uh, this thing again. And this will turn out to be our constant G I'll just write you the summary because we're running out of time. Alpha K square and K Square, right? Which, what is here? Well, this is exactly, so it's the sum for all probabilities that, um, Sorry. It's like we we measure we measure the um, yeah. Look, we measured we measured k. We got out of outcome k. This happened. Uh, so it's here. This is the probability that happens, and this is the probability that then the post selection works. But so it, it's really just the average divided by the probability that the post-selection works. So it's just the, the traditional uh, case of the average as if we had measured one thing and then the other, okay? Like really in series, measure Z and then measure X. Okay, so now what if, what if it's a weak measurement? So in this case, we'll see next time. Uh, did I write it down actually? Yeah, we'll see next time that x of the final state 
is going to be G times something called uh, a weak value. And this up to some things. And this is going to be this. Okay. We'll do this next time. We'll do this explicitly next time. And the idea is going to be that here it's going to be much more subtle what is happening. And in fact, we will it will allow us to link this AW to this probabilities f of p that we talked about in the logical post selection things. Okay. Uh, they will always match the probabilities of outcomes. Which means that when we see a weak value that is kind of outside the range of A, uh, then, sorry, when we see a weak value that is outside the range of zero to one, then it will be a witness that, oh, look, these algebraic conditions were not satisfied. It's like this is a probability, but outside zero, one. For example, it's negative or it's two or so on, uh, which is something that we can like observe experimentally in many rounds of the experiment, right? Uh, good. It's like the equivalent of letting everyone drive drunk, but they're only allowed to drive tricycles. So we see some damage, but not a lot. Um, okay, and then we'll apply this to the Hardy paradox and the other one and the pigeons to see what these weak values actually are. Okay. How much of this will do explicitly will depend on my negotiations with Ralph. Yes? Yeah, that's. Oh, this C should be an X. C is when it should be like a, a general observable. Sorry, what? So I use that one with that value of p. Uh, and, and the thing is that this, when we sandwich each of these on one of them on, on each side, then you know the k's and k primes will, will give you a delta k k prime. So you get rid of one of the sums. And then you'll end up with this. Yeah. Don't worry about it. The, 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 the gist of it, the conclusion is just like if it's a strong measurement, these are exactly the same things, the same probabilities and the same averages that you would expect as if you do one measurement and the other. Not useful. If you do the weak measurement, then we'll see that it's actually it can be very useful and you can all these things in practice. But we don't have time to continue today. Okay, so thank you. See you next week, I think. Or Ralph will see you next week and pick it on from here. All right, thanks. Um, I'll check this out.